Welcome to Church Online today. We are so glad that you are joining us as we continue our series, Clash, When People Collide. If you're encouraged by today's message, please hit the like button and share this message with someone that you care about. Also, be sure to follow us for more great content. Hey kids, there's a special experience available just for you over on our KidsLink Facebook page, so be sure to check that out. Finally, if you would like prayer or you would like to connect with us in any way, please click the link provided and fill out a connection card. Now let's get our worship on. with us who can stop the Lord who can stop the Lord Almighty who can stop the Lord oh who can stop the Lord Almighty who can stop the Lord who can stop the Lord Oh, God. 
Welcome to episode three of Clash. When people collide, we've been talking about conflict resolution. Now, here's the bad news. The bad news is that conflict has this way of robbing us of time, of money, of energy, of opportunity. It adversely affects every single area of our life. Conflict just sucks the life out of us. That's the bad news. But the good news in this series is that resolving conflict is a learned skill. In other words, we can all get better at this. And God has given us so many great instructions on very practically how we can work through conflict. And that's really what this series has been all about. You know, when I was about in eighth grade, I remember writing to law schools saying, hey, what exactly do I need to do to get into law school? Um, because I love to argue and I decided that I should probably get paid for my time. I was a very typical teenager, uh, thought I knew everything. I love to argue. I would argue about anything. So I wrote to law school and said, hey, what do I need to do to get in? I want to be a, I want to be a trial room lawyer. And they said, well, you might want to finish high school first, and then, then you're probably going to need to go to college. And you got a long road ahead of you, so kind of buckle up, do well in school. And so my goal was to argue for a living. I would argue about anything. And I remember when I first got married, Karen and I, we would argue about everything. And uh, before I learned that she was always right, which took probably three or four years, um, I would dig my heels in on things. And there would be times, I will admit now, that I would realize somewhere in the middle of the argument that I was wrong, but I would continue to argue my point just on principle alone. Like, I'm not gonna be wrong on this. I'm gonna dig my heels in. I will defend something that I know is wrong just because I love a good conflict. Have you ever had something like that in your life where you, you thought you were so right about something, but it turned out that you were so incredibly wrong and you look back and think, oh man, I totally, totally missed it right there. Today we're going to discover that God wants us to resolve our conflicts. But in order to do that, he gives us a foundational building block that we're going to unpack today. And that is, I need to own my part. I've got to, I've got to figure out what is my part in this conflict. Now, Jesus spoke directly to this to his followers. The longest recorded talk we have that Jesus gave was called the Sermon on the Mount. And that's because he kind of walked up on a big hill. There were so many people following that he walked up to the top of a hill or a mountain and he began to teach. And he taught for three chapters, Matthew 5, Matthew 6, and Matthew 7. We're toward the end of his talk. We're in Matthew 7 when Jesus drops this little bit of truth on us today. Matthew 7, 3 through 5. He says this, why worry about a speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own? How can you think of saying to your friend, hey, let me help you get rid of that speck in your eye when you can't pass, see past the log in your own eye? Hypocrite, first get rid of the log in your own eye and then you will see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. Now, I always love it when Jesus used eye analogies. As an eye doctor, I love this. I've had the opportunity to take a lot of specks out of people's eyes. I've taken specks of dirt, specks of uh, metal, specks of wood, specks of glass. And it's always amazing. Whenever I take it out, I usually put it on the tip of my finger. There's a little speck here, probably hard to see. But whenever I show them how small the speck is, they're always amazed. They're like, are you kidding me? That tiny little speck caused this much pain. I'm like, yeah, it's all it took. I don't know about you, but when I'm in conflict, my tendency is to think that I've got the speck in my own eye and the other person has this big old log in theirs. And, and my thought behind conflict resolution is, hey, let me help you with that log. I mean, wow, that thing is massive. You need to work on that. <laughs> but Jesus says, actually, folks, it's the other way around. We've got the log and the other person has the speck. And the big idea for today is this. To resolve conflict, I have to own my part 
first. Jesus said, I got to own my part first. How do we do that? I want to give you three practical steps today in owning our part. The first one is this. Number one, I got to check myself. If you go to Urban Dictionary, you will not find the words check myself, but you will find check yourself. And according to Urban Dictionary, check yourself means this. It's to reevaluate our actions after realizing that our current course of action is likely to lead us into troublesome situation. In other words, we realize we're going down the wrong path. We got to check ourselves. We got to be able to say, hey, what's going on here? Now, when it comes to conflict, most of us assume that it's the other person's fault. We hear it all the time. I married the wrong person maybe several times the wrong person or the wrong people. We tend to always think that the other person is way more of the problem than I am. But that's not the reality. The truth is that we do play a role in conflict. And Jesus said, if we really want to get this right, if we really want to resolve the conflict, we need to own our part first. Now, There are two categories to explore here. One is mistakes, and one is just plain sin. Mistake is when I make an error in judgment. There's no malicious intent. I just messed up. I thought this is the right thing to say. I thought this is the right thing to do, but it turned out that it wasn't. I had one of these incidences just recently in church, of course. Where else would it happen? I was speaking at our 1045 service live, and it's coming to the end of the service. And toward the end of the service and the end of my message, the worship team generally comes out and they play a little bit behind me as I wind up. And and so I'm getting toward the end of my message and I'm thinking to myself, the worship team should be out by now. And they're not. And I don't know why they're not. And so I kind of stretch things out a little bit. I'm stretching it out. I'm kind of waiting. I'm kind of waiting. They don't come out. I go into my prayer and I think, okay, they're going to come out during the prayer. They don't come out during the prayer. I pray an extra long prayer. And I get to the end of it, and, I, and you know, I have all sorts of imaginary scenarios going on in my head. Maybe they're at Starbucks and didn't make it back. Maybe, maybe they're at McDonald's. Maybe they're wandering the building. Maybe I finished my message too early. I have no idea what's going on. And so I say, well, this is normally the time when our worship team would be out here playing something kind of almost snarky a little bit. And that's when Beto peeks his head out of the green room and goes, Mark, the video. And I go, oh. I was supposed to introduce a video in which the worship team would come out and they would get set up during the video and I totally forgot it. Now, I'd gotten it right just an hour earlier in the previous service, but for whatever reason in this service, I completely spaced the video and they were completely completely in the right and I was completely in the wrong. I had to check myself. Now, it wasn't malicious. I wasn't trying to be mean. I just messed up. It was a mistake. That's one category. But sin comes in when we decide that we're going to escalate the conflict. I'm going to say things to push your buttons. I'm going to say things that I know are going to hurt you. I'm going to take this, this up a notch. And that's exactly what Jesus says he doesn't want us to do. He doesn't want us to be that person. And you know, ever since the day that sin came into the world, since Adam and Eve, since the very first sin, we have struggled with checking ourselves. You know, God gave Adam and Eve the Garden of Eden and goes, look, you can have this whole place. This entire paradise is yours. You can eat from every tree in the garden except one. There's only one. Just stay away from from this one. But if you eat the fruit from that tree, you're surely going to die. Okay? Really clear boundary, really clear consequence. And what do Adam and Eve do? They eat from the tree. What's interesting is what they do immediately after they eat from the tree. They do three things that we continue to do today. They hide, they cover up, and then they start to blame shift. God asks a very point blank question. Did you eat from the tree? What does Adam do? Well, it's that woman you made me. That woman you created, she gave me the fruit, God. 
probably her fault, but maybe even you're a little bit complicit in the problem. Eve, oh, not me. It's that serpent you made, God. He's the one who tempted me. And from this moment forward in time, when we're caught in conflict and we're caught in sin, our natural tendencies are to hide, to cover up, to be in denial, and then to start blame shifting. 1 John 1, 8 says this, if we claim we have no sin, we're only fooling ourselves and we're not living in the truth. In other words, if we refuse to check ourselves and own our part first, we're living delusional lives. We're living in a fantasy world. We're creating our own reality. And we see this all over in our world today where people are clearly, they're clearly in conflict and they create this imaginary world that they live in where they're right and everyone else is wrong. Have you ever asked that question, what in the world is wrong with everybody? Like, have people lost their minds? And the very fact that we're asking that question probably indicates that we're looking for a speck in other people's eyes while we're holding on to a log in our own. So number one, I gotta check myself. Number two, I've gotta confess my part. I know that when I see a problem, my tendency is to blame the other person and not accept my part of the problem, to not really confess my part of the problem first. And that's exactly what Jesus says we need to do. I also know that when I tend to blame other people, the conflict never really seems to get resolved. In other words, Jesus had some really sage words here. Unless I embrace my part and confess my part of this conflict first, we'll probably never get any resolution. You see, we'll never address what we're unwilling to confess. If we're unwilling to confess our part of it, we'll probably never really address the issue. You know, you talk about conflict. I, I, there's always conflict between siblings, aren't there? You know, Jesus had a, a stepbrother he was in conflict with probably most of his growing up. His name was James, and James never believed that his brother was the son of God or anything special, really, until Jesus died, and then he came back to life, and all of a sudden James said, huh, I guess he really was the son of God. Later, James became a pastor of, of the church in Jerusalem, and he wrote this about conflict in James 5, 16. He said, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other. Why? So that you may be healed. James said, look, there's real value to confessing our part of the problem. And there's real value to owning up. So the fact is, we're really not very good at this. We're not good at confession. We don't like confession. Most of us avoid confession like the plague. How do we get better at this? Well, a great resource that I've run across is a book by a guy named Ken Sandy, and it's called The Peacemaker. And uh, the subtitle is A Biblical Guide to Resolving Personal Conflict. Now, in this book, Ken gives us seven ways that we can learn how to do this confession thing better. And so I want to give you seven things. They all begin with the letter A, so they're easy to remember. And let's just go down them one by one, and let's learn how to get better at this. The first is this. We've got to address everyone involved. So if there's a bunch of people that I've offended, I've got to come clean with all of them. So in my worship team example, I was in staff meeting, and I, I had to address the team and go, hey, you know what, guys? I really screwed up this weekend. Um, when I talked about the worship team, they were totally in the right. I was totally in the wrong. My bad completely. We address everyone involved. The second thing is we want to avoid if, but, and maybe. Nothing waters down a good confession or an apology like saying, well, I did this, but it's really because you made me do it. It's really because it's still really your fault. That's really not a confession at all. That's really not an apology at all. Let's avoid the ifs, buts, and maybes. The third thing is we want to admit very specifically. What exactly did I do? Hey, you know what? 
I made it sound as if you guys should have been on the stage when in fact you weren't supposed to be on the stage. I messed up. I expected something, but I was totally in the wrong. And I very specifically, this is exactly what I did. The more specific we can be, the more likely that confession is to be well received. Fourth thing is this, we're gonna acknowledge the hurt. We're gonna acknowledge the hurt. You know what? When I was standing there talking about you guys not being on stage, it probably made you feel embarrassed. Probably made it feel like it was your fault when in fact it really wasn't your fault. And that's not at all what I wanted to do. We gotta acknowledge how we hurt the other person. The fifth thing is we're gonna need to accept the consequences. Uh, whenever we mess up, whenever we sin, there are always consequences involved. We have to be willing to accept those consequences and realize that there's a penalty to be paid sometimes. And there's some things that we may have to do to make up for this. The sixth thing is this, and it's our whole next point. We have to alter our behavior. It's not okay to just keep doing the same thing over and over and over again. And we're gonna talk about that in just a few minutes. But the last thing, number seven, the last A is, I need to ask for forgiveness. I need to go, hey, I messed up, I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? And then we need to allow time for them to be able to process and to respond. Now, not every offense is gonna cause call for all seven of these. But I think it's a great checklist to work through as I'm thinking through, if I need to confess my part first, this is just a great list to run down through and go, okay, which one of these apply to this situation? And how can I best articulate this to the other person? So, I need to check myself, number one. Number two, I need to confess my part. But number three, and this is equally important to the first two, I've gotta change my behavior. Number three, change my behavior. You know, there's a, a quote going around the meme world that says this, an apology without change is just manipulation. It's a difference between remorse, I got caught and I don't like the consequences, versus what we would call repentance, which means I'm actually sorry for what I did. I wish I wouldn't have done it. There's a guy in the early church named Paul and Paul was a church planter. He would go from city to city around the Mediterranean and he would plant churches. And one of those cities that he planted in was a city called Corinth. Now, Corinth was sort of a hot mess. It was sort of the Las Vegas of the day. It was a big trading city. It was known for its promiscuity. It was known for its wealth. It was known for being really everything different than what God had laid out. So Paul had his work cut out for him. He plants this church and we have these new followers of Jesus who are in this culture that's really, really uh, not godly. And so Paul's trying to instruct them and they had things going on like they had incestual relationships going on. Um, they were misusing the spiritual gifts. I mean, they were just a hot mess. And so Paul wrote a letter to them, we, we now call 1 Corinthians, where he addressed some of these things and goes, hey guys, there's some things going on here. You gotta own your part. There's some things you're doing that just really aren't healthy. Now he followed up the letter to 1 Corinthians with a second letter called 2 Corinthians. And in that letter, he writes this in 2 Corinthians 7 verse nine. Paul writes this, now I'm glad I sent it. He's referring to the first letter. Not because it hurts you, but because the pain caused you to repent and change your ways. It's okay to mess up, but it's not okay to hurt people over and over and over again. You know, classic case is that abusive spouse who, who beats their spouse only when they're drunk. And then, then they apologize profusely when they sober up and go, oh, I'm so sorry, that'll never, ever, ever happen again and they find themselves in this situation over and over and over again. And again, apology without change is just simply manipulation. What really needs to happen is what the Bible calls repentance. 
And I know that's a big Bible word. We don't use the word a lot in, in our normal English language today. But repentance literally means to change my mind, to change how I think about things that result in a change in my behavior. It means waking up to the fact that we've got to own our part and we've got to say, you know what? I keep falling into this pattern whether it's a pattern of mistakes, whether it's a pattern of sin, I keep doing the same thing over and over again, and it needs to stop. I need to change my ways. Now, the world solution to this is what we call behavior modification. We try to just modify our behaviors. We try to, we try to do better. We try, we try harder. We, we, um, we try all sorts of things, and the truth is most behavior modification really doesn't work very well. God said there's a reason for that. It's because unless our thinking changes, unless our heart changes, our behaviors will never change. And here's the value of being in a relationship with God. Only God can change the human heart. Only God can really change the way we think about things, which now results in a change in our behaviors. And so for those of us who've caught ourselves in sort of this repeated over and over again conflict. And we, we find ourselves in conflict with not only our boss, but our spouse and our kids and our neighbors. It's time to stop looking at everybody else and saying, what's wrong with them? And it may be time to look inward to check ourselves. Maybe time to look inward to confess my part and to really begin to say, God, what is it inside of me that needs to change? And that's when we really see real change begin. So why should I own my part in conflict? Well, I don't know about you, but I don't want to live my life being in conflict with people all the time. I want to do my best to resolve conflict because I know that conflict robs me of valuable time and energy, and things that I could be putting into other things that would be so much more profitable. So today, let's listen and embrace Jesus' words. Let's go ahead and check ourselves and say, hey, what part of this conflict is mine? Let's be willing to confess and say, you know what? Here's my part. Let me own up to my part first. Let me go ahead and address the log in my own eye before I go after the speck in your eye. And I'm committing to change my behavior, not on my own, but with God's help. Now, here's what I can tell you. I've lived long enough to see this work. And I know that when we get this right, it has amazing results. I mean, it, it's absolutely de-escalating to every conflict that we get in. It's amazing to me that when I come to somebody else and go, hey, you know what? I messed up, here's my part. It's amazing how quickly most people will reciprocate and go, oh, you know what? I mean, thanks for owning up to that, but the truth is I'm part of this too. And all of a sudden, a conflict which was on the rise is now beginning to de-escalate very quickly. That's what owning my part does. And this is so incredibly countercultural because while the world is embroiled in conflict, we're coming at it through the lens of grace, peace, and conflict resolution. And frankly, almost nowhere in the world is that going on. Now, some of you are skeptical. I just know that. And you're saying, you know what? I may not even be a Jesus follower. Why should I listen to this guy? And here would be my encouragement to you today, if that's you. Try what he says. You don't have to believe in Jesus to have what he says actually work in your life. But I almost promise you, if you take these steps and if you begin to own your part, you'll begin to see that the conflicts that you're in right now will begin to decrease and you're going to enjoy life a lot better. We say it this way, that following Jesus makes our life better. Because following Jesus makes us better at life. Let's get better at life together by owning our part. Let me wrap us up in prayer. God, we thank you for sending your son Jesus. And we thank you, Jesus, for these words that right now we just want to embrace as a people. Our world is in so much conflict right now, God, and we're in so much conflict right now. And my prayer for every single one of us today is that we're going to be able to own our part. That we're going to be able to 
to check ourselves, confess. But God, we're going to lean on you to actually change our ways and to get better at this thing called life. God, will you help us today in the conflicts that we're in right now? Will you help us put into action your words and your advice? We can't do this without you, but with you, God, we can do anything. We love you. We thank you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. If you are new to faith and would like to know what's next for you as a follower of Jesus, or you would like prayer, please click the connection card link. If you would like to live generously, you can give online by, give, by clicking the generosity link. Thank you for partnering with us. Thank you for investing with us in what God cares most about, people. If you would like to further explore today's message, we would love for you to click on the link for the discussion guide where you'll find some scriptures and some questions designed to help you discover more about living as a follower of Jesus Christ. Join us next week for another great message. Have a great day.